Because understanding great literature is better than trying to read and understand yet another business book, on the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, we commit to reading, dissecting, and analyzing the great books of the Western canon. You know, those books, from those written by Jane Austen to Shakespeare's works and everything in between for the last 2,500 years, that you might have fallen asleep to reading when you were trying to read them uh, back in high school. We do this for our audience, the owner, the entrepreneur, the manager, or even the civic leader who doesn't have the time to read, dissect, analyze, and leverage insights from literature to execute leadership best practices in the confusing and chaotic postmodern West we all now inhabit. Welcome to the rescuing of Western civilization at the intersection of literature and leadership. Welcome to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books Podcast. Hello, uh, my name is Hazan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books Podcast, episode number 97. With our book today, a collection of, of what are publicly available, um, speeches and statements from the lips of a man who once said, quite rightly, that, quote, revolutions are based on land, revolutions overturn systems. Of course, when the revolution is over, then the immortal lines of Juan Miranda from the film Duck You Sucka, or A Fistful of Dynamite from the 1970s, then become a little more accurate. And I quote directly from A Fistful of Dynamite, the people who read the books go to the people who can't read the books, the poor people, and say, we have to have a change. So the poor people make the change, huh? And then the people who read the books, they sit around the big polished tables and they talk and talk and talk and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, huh? But what has happened to the poor people? They are dead. Close quote. This orator and revolutionary from the 1960s stood precariously between the revolution and what happened after the revolution as the heir to the ideas of Marcus Garvey and the revolutionary grandfather to Eldridge Cleaver. We will be joined on this revolutionary journey to explore this man's speeches and statements at the close of Black History Month in the United States with our returning guest and sparring partner uh, from episode number 94, where we covered Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, Darolo Nixon Jr. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Darolo. How are you doing today? Thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here as always. All right. And so we will be looking at Malcolm X Speaks. We'll be looking at several different um, several different speeches. We're kind of going to be moving around as we uh, as we go through his speeches. And we'll be talking about, well, we'll be talking about revolution. We'll be talking about the literary life of Malcolm X. And we'll be talking about... <laughs> We're going to talk about what happens after you win the revolution, because that's when the hard part, the less romantic part, really starts to kick in. And there are lessons for leaders inside of that. So from um, Malcolm X's speech, The Black Revolution, uh, this was a speech that was delivered um, at a meeting sponsored by the Militant Labor Forum at Palm Gardens in New York. Uh, on April 8th, 1964, Malcolm X said, and I quote, so today when the black man starts reaching out for what America says are his rights, the black man feels that he is within his rights. When he becomes the victim of brutality by those who are depriving him of his rights to do whatever is necessary to protect himself. An example of this was taking place last night in the same time in Cleveland, where the police were putting water hoses on our people there and also throwing tear gas at them. And they met a hail of stones, a hail of rocks, a hail of bricks. A couple of weeks ago in Jacksonville, Florida, a young teenage Negro was throwing Molotov cocktails. Well, Negroes didn't do this 10 years ago. But what you should learn from this is that they are waking up. It was stones yesterday, Molotov cocktails today. It will be hand grenades tomorrow and wherever else is available the next day. The seriousness of the situation must be faced up to. You should not feel that I am inciting someone to violence. 
I'm only warning of the powder keg situation. You could take it or leave it. If you take the warning, perhaps you could still save yourself. But if you ignore it or ridicule it, well, death is already at your doorstep. There are 22 million African-Americans who are ready to fight for independence right here. When I say fight for independence right here, I don't mean any nonviolent fight or turn the other cheek fight. Those days are gone. Those days are over. George, if George Washington didn't get independence for his country nonviolently, and if Patrick Henry didn't come up with a nonviolent statement, and you taught me to look upon them as patriots and heroes, then it's time for you to realize that I have studied your books well. 1964 will see the Negro Revolt evolve and merge into the worldwide Black Revolution that has been taking place on this earth since 1945. The so-called revolt will become a real Black Revolution. Now, the Black Revolution has been taking place in Africa and Asia and Latin America. When I say Black, I mean non-white, Black, brown, red, or yellow. Our brothers and sisters in Asia who were colonized by the Europeans, our brothers and sisters in Africa who were colonized by the Europeans, and in Latin America, the peasants who were colonized by the Europeans have been involved in a struggle since 1945 to get the colonialists or the colonizing powers, the Europeans, off their land, out of their country. This is a real revolution. Revolution is always based on land. Revolution is never based on begging somebody for an integrated cup of coffee. Revolutions are never fought by turning the other cheek. Revolutions are never based upon love your enemy and pray for those who spitefully use you. And revolutions are never way to sing we shall overcome. Revolutions are based upon bloodshed. Revolutions are never compromising. Revolutions are never based upon negotiations. Revolutions are never based upon any kind of tokenism whatsoever. Revolutions are never even based upon that which is begging a corrupt society or corrupt system to accept us into it. Revolutions overturn systems. And there is no system on this earth which has proven itself more corrupt, more criminal than this system that in 1964 still colonizes 22 million African-Americans, still enslaves 22 million Afro-Americans. There is no system more corrupt than a system that represents itself as the example of freedom, the example of democracy, and can go all over this earth telling other people how to straighten out their house when you have citizens of this country who have to use bullets if they want to cast a ballot. Malcolm X, by the way, X was the name that he chose. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Malcolm X, born Malcolm Little, um, on May 19th, 1925, died February 21st, 1965, was an American Muslim minister and, according to Wikipedia anyway, a human rights activist. And he definitely was one of the most colorful figures of the Black American Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and 60s. Uh, by the way, he was portrayed by Denzel Washington in a burning performance given under the direction of Spike Lee in the 1990s. Malcolm spent his adolescence living in a series of foster homes with relatives after his father's death and his mother's hospitalization. He committed various crimes, being sentenced to eight to 10 years in prison in 1946 for larceny and burglary. In prison, he joined the Nation of Islam, adopting the name Malcolm X to symbolize his unknown African ancestral surname while discarding the, quote, white slave master name of Little. Malcolm X advocated black empowerment and a separation of black and white Americans and was very critical of Martin Luther King Jr. and the mainstream civil rights movement for its emphasis on nonviolence, which you heard in that piece that I read, and racial integration. By the way, if you live by the revolution, you die by it. And Malcolm X did indeed get assassinated on February 21st, 1965. Allegedly, there's still some murkiness on this, by members of the Nation of Islam. Some of Mah Elijah Muhammad's boys, even though Elijah Muhammad claimed all the way to the end of his life that he never laid a hand on Malcolm X. Well, that's also really good rhetoric then, right? Since he wasn't ever accused of being one of the actual assassins. So, you know, as soon as I hear that as a lawyer, it makes me smile because I just say, well, that's that's actually well put. That doesn't tell us much, though, other than that not. you weren't in the room. <laughs> you could send the people in the room, but you weren't in the room. Okay. Okay. Not that I'm accusing him of having X killed. No. no. Not no. that I'm accusing him of that. So, no. Besides, we're not. But somebody had him killed. 
somebody had him killed. <laughs> we're not here to engage in slander. We're here to, well, well, we're here to talk about the impact of Malcolm X on black culture and politics in America. So let's start there. I think there is a direct line from the, not not the intellectual leaders, from uh, there's a direct line from Marcus Garvey to Malcolm X to Black Lives Matter, particularly the, the, the shock troops of Black Lives Matter, um, of BLM, the ones who were burning down cities, you know, a few years ago. Um, and so <sighs> what do we do with Malcolm X? What do we do with Black? How how do how do we I I I and I've hesitated to kind of touch on him on this show because he is so incendiary, but what the heck, why not, right? So what do you what do you think about what do we think about Malcolm X? What do you think about Malcolm X? What sh- how should leaders think about Malcolm X? Because the, he is taught in school as a revolutionary leader that was full of revolutionary Elon. <laughs> uh-huh. And they sort of skip over the parts about the violence and the calls to action that he was making. And I, I think that's rather convenient. At least that's that's my thinking. Yeah. Joint meetings with Nazis. Um, yep. They don't mention that. They don't mention any of that. <laughs> his penchant for um, his snack, his favorite snack food, of course, it was crackers. Right. Mm-hmm. So right. his whole penchant for that whole thing. Right. Anyway. Um, well, so I, I'm glad you did, because I think it's inevitable. Um, I mean, from my perspective, he was like gasoline on a fire or nitroglycerin into an engine for the civil rights movement. He showed up with a very in a very different spirit, with a very different energy, um, with some high claims and with brilliant rhetoric that he used to expose some of the basic propositions uh, at work in America and some of the fundamental um his word would be hypocrisy, right? Mm -hmm. Or chicanery Mm -hmm. um, that was used to deprive so many black men and women of the exercise of their rights, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think if America were a system that just oppressed black people and didn't have any rhetoric about equality and justice and freedom and liberty, uh, his approach would be similar, but there would be less rhetoric and more shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, We need to get free. This is not a free system, so we're going to overthrow it. You know, the challenge, part of the the challenge for him um, was being able to use a system that is being misused against um, himself and against our people to then get it to perform better. You know, one of Mm -hmm. the lines he said in more than one speech was directed at white members of the audience where he said, look, um, if this makes you uncomfortable, fine. You go tell the mayor to stop sending police dogs, right. you know, attacking, yep. you know, black protesters mm-hmm. and then it will stop. Um, and then you don't have to feel uncomfortable. And if you don't, your kids will grow up and look at you and point a finger and say shame. And right. I, I think it's actually a very valid point um, where, you know, there's an illicit permission from the white majority for what went on 40s, 50s and 60s to mm-hmm. to for that to continue. Um, that had to be there. Um, you know, if we back up, you know, almost 200 years before that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the illicit permission was withdrawn, and the majority, you know, in America, the majority of the colonists supported a revolution against the oppressive powers of the British Parliament uh, in the name of King George the Third. So, you know, that that illicit that that not illicit that tacit permission. Okay, that unspoken, that silent majority's willingness or unwillingness to to stand up and take action uh, is very powerful. You know, it's very powerful. And it also will help address, you know, a later point that you're going to ask that I won't raise now because we're going to address it later. But so, you know, I think throwing gasoline on a fire, putting nitrous in an engine, this is what he brought. And of course, um, another way of putting it is he's our Che Guevara, right? He's the guy in the T-shirts. You don't have Mm -hmm. you don't have King on a T-shirt. You don't, okay? With right. the fists and everything. You get fists yeah. and the yeah. pendants. And I mean, I used to have like an African pendant, like the 90s was big. It was like the 70s, late 60s redo. So I remember <clears> wearing that, the dashiki. I remember yep. when I got one in middle school, my parents gave me one. I remember that, you know? Um, and I think that was slightly before that movie came out. Um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite performances by Denzel Washington. Um, I will um, take that over training day, seven days out of seven. 
Yeah, um, Training Day was the movie that Denzel promised us he wasn't going to do. Like that's the movie he promised. That's exactly the movie he promised. That's that, and that's where I I realized Denzel. Well, Denzel's really just an actor. Like at the end of the day, like we have to, we have to. We, I'm not taking anything away from his acting, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, he is an actor. So he's not. He's not. Well, he's not a revolutionary. We know that. Not a revolutionary. No, he's not. No, he's not a revolutionary. Not a revolutionary. Yeah, I think my next performance would be the one uh, where he did Stephen Biko. I didn't know who Biko was. No, and we watched that in school, uh, and it was very moving. He did an excellent job. An excellent job. Um, And uh, he he helped dramatize. You know, um, (laughs) another system where racial oppression had dog's teeth and not rubber bullets. And so, you know, um, well, and this is, this is people set up to it as they should. Well, this is the thing with Malcolm X. So Malcolm X is assassinated in 1965. Right. Um, You have the riots of the late Mm sixties. Then you have the, 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 the black Panther party and Eldridge Mm -hmm. Cleaver and soul mm-hmm. on ice and all them mm-hmm. boys come mm-hmm. out in the seventies. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. a weird thing happens. And I want to talk about this a little bit early, but a weird thing happens where black culture splits between, and I'm going to use two different types here. It spits be- splits between Bill Cosby before we knew who he was and the Claire Huxtable line of the black, of black folk. And, and then, and then you get into, and then it splits between that and, and the more lower class rap culture, hip hop culture that eventually winds up, washes up on the shores of NWA and all those boys in the 90s, right? New mm-hmm. Jack City, NWA, Boys in the Hood, all of that, right? And mm-hmm. black culture visibly splits in America in a post Malcolm X world. Um, mm-hmm. My question here is, and I'm going to ask you a what if, would black culture have split if Malcolm X hadn't gotten assassinated? Um, because it did visibly split, but it, it's to me it's tough. Um, because and I mean it's almost a cop out. There's just there are too many variables. But here's what I mean. Right. Yeah. Um, would he have succeeded in his revolution? Would he have succeeded in forming some kind of separatist black community of actual size somewhere in the United States? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a, a version of the Free State of Jones, right? Something like that. And there's actually a book I want to find that talks about various of those separatist movements because there's more than one. And I found that I find it I found it fascinating just learning that because I, I didn't know that. Um, but anyway, so would 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 they have succeeded? You know, um, and and who knows where it would have been because I mean he was certainly an urban creature, correct? Um, right. You know, he's not. He, it's not just he's not out farming. It's just you know. Um, I just don't, I get no sense from reading his words that he had much of an understanding, despite what he said about Texas and Mississippi, of how life is in Texas and Mississippi for blacks to live in rural areas. Therefore, it's hard for me to picture, you know, his revolution producing something like separatism, excuse me, within, you know, urban spaces, certainly back east, right? Um, rather than a colony in the desert, like where I am, something like that. But, you know, that's so that's one of the questions. Would it have been successful? OK, assume it would. But on what scale? And, and we can't tell what scale. Then, um, you know, are we also assuming are we assuming he survives, but King still dies. Right. right. Kennedy still dies. And so right. that means that, you know, this great. Cause, I mean, that was a decade. It's a decade where our fathers were killed. OK. Mm -hmm. Two Kennedys, King and X, slain, okay? Because the changes they were pushing for, um, people didn't want to have. And people were willing to kill them and did. Um, And so those changes didn't happen. Followed by, you know, drug malaise-filled 70s disillusionment, right? And so it's going to get to a point that you still haven't raised, technically. (laughs) But it's coming because I can read it in the script. But it's, Mm -hmm. you know, drugs being... Part of the answer to that question so it's just right. like you know um would that would that split that shift you know still have happened probably i mean going back well, to invisible man right the well the well what's weird is that, yeah go ahead well what's weird is eldridge cleaver mm-hmm. 
turned out to be a Republican. Uh huh. After he got out of like after he after he went through all the stuff with the Black Panthers, and I, I think I think if I remember correctly, he went to prison. Um, you know, and he's a Republican now. Mm-hmm. Like I don't I don't think people have a concept of like how that occurs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it occurs I think because of. Well, it's what you it's what you said, and we're going to talk about this. Um, this is in, in sort of the after we talk a little bit about his his essay on the ballot or the or not essay, but his speech, the ballot or the bullet. Um, we want to tie that in, but we're fifty years on from getting everything we legally we've gotten everything we asked for mm-hmm. as as quote unquote black people. We've gotten everything we asked for. Matter of fact, um, we got it in a way that. To paraphrase from Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> who's paraphrasing from the book of Isaiah, justice rolled down the, you know, rolled down the uh the mountainside like water, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know that Malcolm X would have known what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Revolutionaries mm-hmm. almost never know what to do once they win. Lenin was the only revolutionary, Lenin and Mao too. Lenin and Mao were the two revolutionaries of the 20th century who knew exactly what they wanted to do. After they won the revolution, whole pot um, I throw in there too. He was like number three. Okay. Um, Everybody else seems I to mean, have caught by. You got the, Ho like Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh knew what to do, uh, yeah, and okay. arguably actually did that better than the other people you named. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> his probably. system is still going. <laughs> <laughs> his system is still going. You know, Mao's is fundamentally modified, um, still oppressive, but fundamentally modified. Um, because of the because Deng could read the writing on the wall, right? So right. and did, um, but yeah, I, so I know what you mean. But so the examples I thought of, though, revolutionaries who actually did have a plan, right? Yeah. Um, and so I guess some of this though will relate to, um, well, is it a real revolution or not? Okay, because as you just quoted X saying, right? Um, and I'm gonna find the actual full quote because I circled it. Yep. Um, revolutions overturn systems. Okay. Mm-hmm. Revolutions overturn systems. Okay. And so if we want to be technical or narrow, a revolution is successful just by overturning a system. So if you burn it down, great. You know, that may actually not technically mean you overturn the system. Okay. Um, and certainly in a digital age, we know it wouldn't be. You destroy all the banks in America. Well, the money isn't really the cash. So they're right. okay. You know, right. um, you have to destroy a whole lot of servers and other things to actually damage the banking system. Um, and that would just be temporary anyway. Um, so um, they overturn systems. Right. But a, a, a true revolution overturns one system and replaces it with another. Right. right? And so um, there are revolutionaries who are prepared for that next step. It's just ironically or not, where I would expect to find them is functioning well within institutions that are primed to then step in as the new model and as the new actual institution. So the two who came to mind, Thomas Jefferson came to mind first. He came to mind, you know, super early. And then Hamilton came to mind this morning where I said, oh, okay, these were people who one fought and one governed during our, you know, great American revolution. Uh, which, contrary to what X actually said, um, they're black people who fought in that revolution. Um, and, um, you know, very many thousands, okay, because that precious germ seed of freedom meant something uh, um, uh, okay, it meant something to um meant something to them that they were willing to put their lives on line. So I'm not talking about people who were enslaved, who were forced to do fighting for their masters. I'm not talking about that. And there wasn't nearly as much of that. My understanding is there wasn't nearly as much of that during the Revolutionary War as there would have been during the Civil War. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, or and as then as did occur during the Civil War. With that, we're going to go back to the book. Back to um, the speeches Selected speeches and statements of Malcolm X. So um, I'm going to pick up from another one of his speeches that sort of backs up what uh, DeRolo and I have been talking about. And I'm going to pick certain areas here to read because they're 
uh, the, the whole thing sort of sort of hangs together and it is a, it is a long speech um it's called the ballot or the bullet and this speech was delivered um by Malcolm X uh to let me go ahead and pull this up um <laughs> 10 days after Malcolm X's declaration of independence um he he delivered um a a speech right in Cleveland uh, given at the Cory Methodist Church on April 3rd, 1964. And um, Malcolm X in the ballot or the bullet here presented many of the themes that he had been developing as he had been um, uh, holding and speechifying at public rallies in Harlem. And uh, he was forming the ideology of a new movement. And in the ballot or the bullet, he lays out some of the ideas in this new ideology. By the way, an ideology different than that of the NAACP, um, an ideology different than that of um, of CORE, um, which, um, oh gosh, uh, and, and an ideology that really began his move towards Black nationalism and Black separatism. And I quote from the ballot or the bullet. It was the black man's vote that put the president administration in Washington, D.C. Your vote, your dumb vote, your ignorant vote, your wasted vote put in an administration in Washington, D.C. that has seen fit to pass every kind of legislation imaginable, saving you until last and filibustering on top of that. And your and my leaders have the audacity to run around clapping their hands and talk about how much progress we're making and what a good president we have. If he wasn't good in Texas, he sure can't be good in Washington, D.C., because Texas is a lynch state. In the same breath as Mississippi, no different. Only they lynch you in Texas with a Texas accent and lynch you in Mississippi with a Mississippi accent. And these Negro leaders have the audacity to go and have some coffee in the White House with a Texan, a Southern cracker, that's all he is, and then come out and tell you and me that he's going to be better for us because he's from the South, since he knows how to deal with the Southerners. What kind of logic is that? Let Eastland be president. He's from the South, too. He should be better able to deal with them than Johnson. By the way, pause the uh, the president he's talking about is Lyndon Johnson. This is following the assassination of um, of uh, Robert. Ke I'm sorry, not Robert um, John F. Kennedy in November of 1963. Back to the book, uh, or back to the speech. In this president administration, they have in the House of Representatives 257 Democrats to only 177 Republicans. They control two thirds of the House vote. Why can't they pass something that will help you and me? In the Senate, there are 67 senators who are the Democratic Party. Only 33 of them are Republicans. Why, the Democrats have got the government sewn up, and you're the one who sewed it up for them. And what have they given you for it? Four years in office and just now getting around to some civil rights legislation? Just now, after everything else is gone out of the way, they're going to sit down now and play with you all summer long. The same old giant con game that they call filibuster. All those are in cahoots together. Don't you ever think they're not in cahoots together? Um for the man that is heading the civil rights filibuster is a man from Georgia named Richard Russell. When Johnson became president, the first man he asked for when he got back to Washington, D.C. was Dickey. That's how tight they are. That's his boy. That's his pal. That's his buddy. But they're playing that old con game. One of them makes you believe he's for you and he's got it fixed when the other one is so tight against you. So you never have to keep his promise. So he never has to keep his promise. So it's time in 1964 to wake up. And when you see them coming up with that kind of conspiracy, let them know your eyes are open and let them know you got something else that's wide open, too. It's got to be the ballot or the bullet, the ballot or the bullet. If you're going to use you're going to be afraid to use an expression like that, you should get out of the country. You should get back into the cotton patch. You should get back in the alley. <laughs> they get all the Negro vote. And after they get it, the Negro gets nothing in return. And all they did when they got to Washington was give a few big Negroes big jobs. Those big Negroes didn't need big jobs. They already had jobs. That's camouflage. That's trickery. That's treachery. Window dressing. I'm not trying to knock out the Democrats for the Republicans. We'll get to them in a minute. But it is true. You put in Democrat first and the Democrats put you last. Look, look at the way it is with the alibis they use since they control Congress and the Senate. What alibi do they use when you and I ask, well, what are you going to do to keep your promise? They blame the Dixiecrats. What is a Dixiecrat? A Democrat. A Dixiecrat is nothing but a Democrat in disguise. The titular head of the Democrats is also the head of the Dixiecrats because the Dixiecrats are part of the Democratic Party. The Democrats have never kicked the Dixiecrats out of the party. The Dixiecrats bolted themselves once. But the Democrats didn't put them out. Imagine these low-down Southern segregationists put the Northern Democrats down. But the Northern Democrats never put the Dixiecrats down. Now, no, look at that thing the way it is. They've got a con game going on, a political con game, and you and I are in the middle. 
it's time for you and me to wake up and start looking at like what it is and trying to understand it like it is. And then we can deal with it like it is. Now, I'm going to move forward a little bit in the ballot and the bullet. He says, I say again, I'm not anti-Democrat. I'm not anti-Republican. I'm not anti-anything. I'm just questioning their sincerity and some of the strategy that they've been using on our people by promising them promises they don't intend to keep. When you keep the Democrats in power, you keep the Dixiecrats in power. I doubt that my good brother Lomax will deny that. A vote for a Democrat is a vote for a Dixiecrat. That's why in 1964, it's time now for you and me to become more politically mature and realize what the ballot is for, what we're supposed to get when we cast a ballot, and that if we don't cast a ballot, it's going to end up in a situation where we're going to have to cast a bullet. It's either a ballot or a bullet. It's either a ballot or a bullet. In reading that speech from Malcolm X, I uh, I thought the more things change, the more they remain regrettably the same. Mm-hmm. I could hear these words coming out of, well, I could hear these words coming out of some Black Lives Matter activist gesticulating on Instagram. but what malcolm x didn't get because he didn't fundamentally understand and he was playing his own game of centralization what he didn't understand was that all politics are local or maybe he did understand that i I don't know even washington dc politics are local which is something we don't understand in our era and we actually saw this and explore this a little bit on this podcast when we read the letters or the the essay by Theodore Roosevelt talking about how when he was in Albany um, as a senator um, back in the early part of the 20th century, and people would come to him giving him a critique or asking him about a bill, they would come to him in a way that didn't respect what he did as a politician. The trends that began at the end of the Civil War and the collapse of Reconstruction continue through to today, wherein Black Americans too often look to the ballot and political power to solve cultural issues, which is exactly what Malcolm X, I think, was trying to do. Now, this works less and less well over the course of time because Black Americans are experiencing, as I've said before, the long-term economic, cultural, and moral effects of winning basically the revolution with the passage of the 1968 Civil Rights Act. This, of course, gets to a question that DeRolo and I have kind of been talking about already. What do you do after you win the revolution? What do you do after you've cast ballots or cast bullets? Um, I am troubled. I'll put this to DeRolo. DeRolo, I am troubled by Malcolm X's lack of vision. (laughs) I don't think he had a vision much past the revolution. I I really don't. Mm -hmm. And I am troubled by the fact that 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 tick seems to have been picked up by future revolutionary movements that ape. They ape the posture of Malcolm X, but they don't have Mm -hmm. any of the, as you put it, rhetorical skills. Mm -hmm. Comments on Uh the ballot of the bullet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, you know, um, it actually, if I'm not mistaken, that's I mean, it's it's most likely his phrase. But um, there's another you're going to pardon the expression. There's another old Negro revolutionary Mm -hmm. who I believe said this first. Um, Yeah, there we go. Bear with me a sex. Yep. Um, Yep. There we go. Got it. Um, nope, don't want that. Where is it? Where's the good part of the quote? Um, there we go. From the first, I saw no chance of bettering the condition of the freed man, meaning the freed black man, until he should cease to be merely a freed man and should become a citizen. Uh, and this is a point that X also brought up, right? The difference between being in America and being an American 
and how it didn't take any legislation for a Polish man to become an American, but apparently it took legislation for African Americans to become American. And he right. meant in the 20th century when he was saying it, not in the 19th. Anyway, I'll pick up. I insisted that there was no safety for him, nor for anybody else in America, outside the American government, that to guard, protect, and maintain his liberty, the freedman should have the ballot, that the liberties of the American people were dependent upon the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box, that without these, no class of people could live and flourish in this country. And this was now the word for the hour with me and the word to which the people of the North willingly listened when I spoke, period, close quote. And of course, what I'm doing is quoting Frederick Douglass. My fellow Rochesterians, and uh, that great symbol of uh, American freedom, Black American freedom, and opportunity in the 19th century. So, uh, but yes, um, so it's weird because I think I think X had real vision. Um, he had you know narrow experience, but real vision, right? And so um, he was somebody who would. Um, in a monolithic sense, speak of the South and then extend it to the four corners of America. Whereas I think that the regional differences mattered then and still mattered even today. Um, that the type of experience you can have and the type of, types of opportunities that are presented to you or deny you or that you can, the, the fights you have to get what is yours or what you're seeking, um, they don't play out the same way in the four corners of America. Um, they just don't. And so, you know, you said all politics is local. Culture is also local. Um, and so those local differences matter. They're very real differences even between <laughs> between Texas, Louisiana and Mississippi. There's differences that are. Significant. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, anyway, um, so it, it's weird. But I, I think he had vision in his real, you know, transformative moment, of course, was when he when he went abroad, when he mm -hmm. went abroad. And his nation of Islam influenced thinking encountered Orthodox Islam practice in uh, Mecca, Medina and Jeddah and then in other parts of, of the world, some of which I've been to, mm -hmm. uh, some of which me, the Christian, has been to. Um, and that that started the shift in his thinking. One of the reasons I think you're not going to see people on X or whatever who will have the force and the power of what, um, and this is going to be an interesting, dangerous statement, but of the force and the power of what X was saying is he actually seemed to be racist. And thus, when he's up there saying the truth that sometimes he will then clothe with this, you know, offensive rhetoric, it's one of the reasons it had its power, you know. Um, and again, I, I go back to the statement that he made more than once to white members of the audience when he was speaking, like, look, you know, if if this is actually an issue, as I'm identifying it, you go to the mayor and say, stop sicking the police dogs on, you know, black people, and then it will stop. And so, well, you know, well, and he, had, he had a problem yeah. with we shall overcome, like he mentions this several times in several different speeches. He it had a problem really with got we, to him. It really that got to him. Song really <laughs> got to him, you know. Um, and he's got a great line about revolutions and they're not being singing. It's in um, message to the grassroots, you know, it's yes. actually, so in our version, it's on page nine, right? Yep. You don't do that in a rep. This is a quote. You don't. Do, oh, actually, I got to back up um, because, you know, no, you need a revolution. Whoever heard of a revolution where they lock arms as Reverend Pleage mm -hmm. was pointing out beautifully singing. We shall overcome. You don't do that in a revolution. You don't do any singing. You're too busy swinging, <laughs> you know, and it's just like it, it's funny. And on one level, I think he makes a point where it bothers me is that um, that's a song of hope. And it's a song that says, even though these are our darkest moments, the we're in jail, chain to a wall on death row moments, um, we shall overcome that, you know. With God's help, we will get through and overcome all of this opposition because we know that when God started this great American experiment, you know, that freedom, liberty, and justice were what he wanted for anybody who was there. And therefore, we will overcome. We will succeed in overcoming all of the machinations and filibustering and hypocrisy of our enemies, 
whom he also addressed, of course, in his speeches. Friends and enemies. And it's friends and like, enemies. Who says that? <laughs> but it's great because we have them. Right. So why not talk to them? He did, you know. Um, well, he, he also says. when they pray, they're talking at Satan because they're <laughs> dealing with their actual enemy. And there's something to that to recognize. Let's not let's let's make no bones about this. This is who I'm talking to. And this is what I'm saying with this authority. And so he would do that. And I mean, so much of so much of what happens, you know, now. And I mean, of course, you know, we're talking 64. He's talking about the election of 64 and ballot and the bullet. Um, it, this is 60 years later. 60 right? years later. Right. So someone up there talking. OK. Um, without, you know, the real someone up there talking. Other than it, so this is obviously my point of view, but other than in certain limited circumstances, um, almost none of which are actually systemic. Um, you can't get up there with that moral weight that he had and talk about, you know, the the United States of hypocrisy. OK, right. because it wasn't it, it's not that way now. I was at a rally. Um, so my wife is Ukrainian. I was at a rally over the weekend in support of Ukrainian freedom um on the two-year anniversary of putin's invasion of of you know my wife's birth country anyway um one of the men up there with a big american flag you know no mm -hmm. accent in english I, I can't obviously comment if he had an accent in ukraine he didn't have an accent in english at all he sounded like normal white man from ohio okay mm -hmm. um talked about this being the land of freedom and opportunity but opportunity of course is something that um isn't presented to you on a silver platter like right. John the Baptist's head was to Herodias. You right. know, you have to chase it. You have to work for it. And it's not just black and white people now in this dialectic or dynamic or dichotomy trying to do this. There's all these other groups. And in one of his speeches, he lumped them all together. He said, oh, when I say black revolution, I mean non-white. Okay. Um, the problem with that is it obscures a multipolar world. That's one of the problems with that. Okay. And so in a multipolar America, as it were, where you have literally several generations of success for some Asian groups for and, and listen to me talking about groups, Asian Americans, OK, of mm -hmm. different sorts, African Americans mm -hmm. of different sorts, and even within our own community, as it were. Um, well, but, but what type of black American are you talking about? Is this some, an, an African immigrant? You know, I was actually I was at a presentation yesterday um by a certified financial professional who's from Burundi in East Africa okay and she's doing her thing and, and making her presentation that's great this woman has success she has two master's degrees as she told us in her presentation okay that was not the reality that X was fighting the right. reality that he was fighting was an oppression that needed to be overthrown um and so now that as you pointed out okay the revolution is conceded great okay so where are we um Part of the problem that people have who get up there with their BLM stuff is that the we and the where is now no longer monolithic, okay? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm going to jump to the point that <laughs> you still haven't raised, but I, I, will, I will jump to that point if you let me. Well, okay. one second. Before you jump to that point, I want to, I want to make one point. Um, yeah, I want yeah. to make one point from that same speech where you mentioned um, – and this is the the message to grassroots. And I, I highlighted something in here. Um, it's on page 12 um, at the bottom of it. And I, and I want to, when I hit, when I read this, I started laughing because you talk about we shall overcome and how that just got in his craw. And this is why it got in his craw. And this is a fundamental religious difference between the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Islamic <laughs> Malcolm X. There is nothing in our book, this is from Malcolm X, there is nothing in our book, the Quran, that teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone, but if someone puts his hand on you, send him to the cemetery. That's a good religion. In fact, that's an old-time religion. That's that old-time religion. That's the one that Ma and Pa used to talk about. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a head for a head, and a life for a life. That's a good religion. And nobody resents that kind of religion being taught but a wolf who intends to make you his meal. That right there, I laughed out loud. Because you talk about the weight of moral authority. The weight of moral authority came in both Malcolm X and in the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from their religion. 
Mm-hmm. That's where the weight of their moral authority came from. You're not going to get in a modern era, 60 years later, you're not going to get the weight of moral authority from entertainment or from media or even from any form of cultural Marxism. You're not going to get the weight. That's why BLM frittered away. That's why all these DEI programs are frittering away. They have no weight of moral authority because they were based on something. They are based on things that do not. No, they were based on things that rest on other things that we don't talk about anymore. Mm. Capitalism has to rest on something else. It cannot just be itself. There has to be a, an underpinning to it. And this is something that I think we sense in our era and leaders sense it, but we don't actually know how to put it into words. Mm. I think we struggle with how to put it into words. And then we look back and we try to adopt the rhetoric and adopt the pose and adopt the flash, but the substance underneath is missing. And thus you become a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, what is it? Um, um, Coleman Hughes. I was listening to him talk the other day and me and Coleman, we don't share the same religious beliefs. We we just, we just don't, we're not that guy, but he made, he made a point. He said, when you go out and survey people, black and white and you ask them how many black men got shot each year before 2020 they will say a thousand has to be a thousand Mm -hmm. he said actually when you go and look at the numbers because all these crime statistics are reported it's like Mm -hmm. 12 Mm -hmm. by cops 12 Mm -hmm. now is Mm -hmm. that good no, no one should be shot, blah, 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 all the usual bona fides, right? All the usual things we say to sort of buffer that. But 12? 12 is not a 1,000. Where is your moral authority? And this is the thing. When you win the revolution, you have to establish your moral authority someplace else, and it has to be something that's going to be old time. I would prefer it be, and you and I would prefer it be that old time religion, <laughs> that old time <laughs> Christian religion the New Mm -hmm. Testament Christian religion, preferably, if we're going to base it on something. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be based on that old-time religion. And that was the thing that Malcolm X had and that many of those revolutionary leaders of the 60s that we lionize now, that's what they had. They had religion. And we don't need to make that point um, as baldly as we should. Cultural Marxism isn't going to get you there. It'll get you you into a DEI shakedown of a corporation. (laughs) Somebody will get paid. (laughs) <laughs> and then they'll go buy a house. By the way, that's what all you want to know where all the money went that all those corporations donated to BLM and went to go buy BLM leaders' houses. Well, we know this for a fact. That's a shame. Oh, it didn't go into communities. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't help people get out of prison fast or didn't do any of that crap. It yeah. just went to go buy some cultural Marxist mm-hmm. who's running a grift. Another house. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough because it was such a such a powerful hashtag, and then it then ends up, you know, per- spawning this movement, and then the movement starts going in these directions, and it's like, hey, let's back up. Right. When you're protesting the unjust <laughs> murder of a black man by a policeman i got you i'm there with you let's do this okay because this shouldn't happen to anybody i don't care what color the person is this is not how it's supposed to go the police are supposed to enforce the law they're supposed to catch people who break the law they're not supposed to take the law into their hands that's one thing but they're certainly not supposed to break the law (laughs) trying to achieve whatever end we got that we got that we got that i mean the whole the whole moral impulse behind Watergate rests on that principle that Correct. you're there, the law binds you too. But where does Don't the law come the from? We never we never talk about where the law comes from. This is a worldview issue. What mm. worldview? Doug Wilson, the pastor Doug Wilson says it's either Jesus <laughs> or it's something else. That's it. You got it. And, and, and we don't, my God, one of the things I want to do on this podcast this year is talk about, and we are going to talk about it in the coming months on this podcast, but worldviews really do matter because everybody's walking around talking about solutions, not talking about solutions, talking about problems. Where are we going to base our solutions? Right. What is going to be the foundational rock? And you're you're going to come coming back in July to talk about the foundational documents. Those guys 
the founding fathers, the American revolution that, that even Malcolm X mentions, it wasn't based on Islam, kids, and it wasn't based on secular atheism. Nope. Right. It was based on Christianity, rock rib mm-hmm. Christianity. So George Floyd's death, while tragic, and the other 12 black men and the other thousands of other <laughs> men from uh, with, of, of other hues and colors and different levels and degrees of melanin, their deaths, while tragic, if we're going to protest that, we have to figure out what our worldview is from protesting that. And it cannot be based, I don't think it can be based on a Twitter hashtag. You don't have the moral authority. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Um, and I, get, I, get, I get excited. I get irate about this because it drives me absolutely nuts. It drives me absolutely crazy. And mm-hmm. so it, it just, it does. It drives you crazy. That's why I get up on my high horse about this. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah. So um, one of the, you know, issues that we're going to address is, you know, this Elon of uh, revolution yeah. uh, that apparently has worn out among average black people in America um, still has some purchase for elites within black culture. Right. Um, so, you know, Claudine Gay thinks that she's fighting a revolution, making nine hundred thousand dollars a year as, as the as now the former president of Harvard. And I can name other people, too. You make a nine hundred K a year, honey. You're not you're not fighting a revolution. Sorry, you're 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 not. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Um. So. Um. So the question for me is, oh, OK, well, but why has that happened? Why? Um, why is revolution something that um, black people on any kind of scale, in, black people in America, on any kind of scale, with few exceptions, just don't seem to be interested in, okay? Um, and of course, there's a line, um, and not just a line, there's a whole dynamic within uh, the movie Jerry Maguire, Mm-hmm. Um, for which, of course, Cuba Gooding Jr. got his Oscar. And I remember my father, my late father, who used to tell me from time to time, oh, you know, someone mistook me for Cuba Gooding Jr. And I used to think that it was the craziest thing he was saying until I was standing with him once when it happened. And I was literally so mad at the woman. I was so mad. Like, how can you not see this is my father? No, he does not. Like, anyway, um, in the movie, though, Yes. His character, uh, his brother was still militant. And he's right. like, Tiku, we love you. You're still militant. Of course, he's right. standing, doing great his raising fist, just like I am right now, except I'm seated, raising the fist. Yeah. Um, you know, played by the great Harry Spears. <laughs> yeah, but even then, right? That was one guy in a family. Right. Right. That was one guy in a family. It wasn't whole households, at least in that movie, it wasn't whole households, right? But it's just why is that the case? And I think there's several dynamics that explain why, even from, you know, 1968 to 1993, you know, that's when the shift happened. But um, even, and it, you can even back up, it probably, the shift was probably done sometime in the 80s. But anyway, um, but there, there's several dynamics that played out that to me help explain why revolution doesn't really sell you can't sell revolution to um most black people in the street um right or in the off certainly in the office but even in the street um it's just it's 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 not a thing here's why uh i think it's because of mass incarceration suburbanization and drugs okay plus mm-hmm. the destruction of system systemic racism or most of it in america and then the increase in economic success that certain you know, black individuals and families and communities have experienced. And so because of that, um, the we is now in quotation marks. And then the location where we are, the place, you know, that's also in quotation marks because, you know, you might be able to sell it to someone who's still ghettoized, to someone who, you know, ghettoized, grew up in foster care, you know, is dealing with a gang, but the right way, meaning they're fighting them. You can sell that person on revolution, absolutely um what that's much easier to do than to sell that person on opportunity but you know why is that the case look at that person's experience look at his experience he's a man in my head so look at his experience Mm -hmm. this explains why um when you teach him that america is about freedom and opportunity he thinks you're crazy because that's not what he knows 
And then when you take him out of those environments, right, and you introduce him to another environment where people invest in him, support him, um, instruct and guide him into uh, more mainstream experiences in American culture, then, then there's a real revolution, but it's an internal revolution. And all of a sudden, his whole perspective shifts and he can see, wait a minute, this, this was here this whole time. I just had to go 35 blocks that way, but this is here the whole time, you know? Um, and I can make use of this and, 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 and then start to do something, give back, have an impact and live out those values that he now has, you know, that accord very much with the existing American system. You know, it's, it's, it fascinates me. Hello. So I'm going to do some shilling here and uh, hopefully this will be a pause in our riveting conversation for you. I have an offer for you. My most recent book is 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership. It's available in paperback, hardcover, or as an ebook on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and any other place you order books. Now in this book, I address the 12 leadership areas that I have found leaders need to be the most intentional in to be the type of leader followers actually want to follow. From establishing a foundation of leading teams through managing conflict effectively, all the way through leading teams through change, knowing what to do and why to do it can help readers, like the ones listening to this show, become better leaders. Look, reading this book and living it is like getting coaching from me directly without having to pay my full coaching rate. Head on over to leadershiptoolbox.us, that's leadershiptoolbox.us, and scroll down the homepage and click on the Buy Now button to purchase in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle format on Amazon, uh, 12 Rules for Leaders, the Foundation for Intentional Leadership. And that's it for me. Now back to the show. Did you ever watch the show the wire on hbo oh yeah um, okay all right and so not, i probably saw one or two episodes okay all right i watched all five seasons of that show wow i am a huge <laughs> i am a huge the wire fan huge fan of that show and the wire number one i don't think we're ever going to do something as complex and as deep as the wire on american television Again, like I, I don't think we have the the capacity, the writing capacity. Talk about what your worldview is based on. The current writing that we have in Hollywood, um, and in and in popular culture in general is is just sort of cannibalizing off the past because there's no foundational there's no foundational elements underneath a lot of what is being produced now at the mass culture quote unquote level. Mm. With that being said. The Wire and The Sopranos were probably the two best shows of the early 2000s, bar none, and of the early 21st century, bar none. Great writing on both those shows. Um, there's a character in The Wire who is on drugs um, named Bubs. Mm -hmm. And um, Bubs tells one of the detectives one time who's trying to get him off the street um, that it's a thin line between heaven and here, right? And I always think about that. When I would live in the kinds of places that you and I, the kind of places you and I both came from, and I would see people who have a university in their town that they have easy access to, but they can't walk the three, it's a long way from, I won't say the name of the high school, but it's a long way from that high school. You know which one I'm talking about in the downtown of where we were at. It's a long way from there to that, that, to that university in that town. It's a mm -hmm. long walk, even though it's mm -hmm. only a bus ride. And the that was demonstrated in the wire um, through Bub's ex, through the, the through Bub's experience through a couple of other experiences in the um, in the you know, of characters in the show. I mean, one character in the show he starts out as a drug dealer, goes to jail, and basically talk about having his eyes open. Has his eyes open because he starts reading books like To Kill a Mockingbird because he finally has time to read, mm -hmm. and he was always smart. 
he knew how to play chess. Actually, there's a great scene in in in, in, the, in the show early, early in the first season where he's explaining to the other the other the other drug runner kids on the corner how to play chess because they're screwing it up. And he's like, nope, nope, nope. You know, like the king stays, the queen stays the queen and the pawns move around, but the king stayed the king. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's all these sort of iconic, iconic ideas that are in the wire and it layers in this depth. So anyway, this character goes to jail, finds out that his uncle basically betrayed him and he he gets killed in jail. Um, But before he goes, before he gets killed, he has that light bulb go off of, oh, I could have had a middle class life. He doesn't know that word. He doesn't know that term um and of course he believes in racism and police you know brutality and da, 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 da. and he doesn't tie it to the life choices he's making he's just existing inside of this system and it's a long way from where he is in the baltimore housing projects mm-hmm. to the university of maryland or johns is, hopkins or johns hopkins which is literally right over there yeah johns hopkins is right over there it is a very long way yes Yes. Um, and I don't think we do a good job. No, I won't say we don't think we do a good job. I think that the full realization of the victories of the revolution is this conversation we're having right now. I think mm-hmm. this is the full revel- re- resolution, revel- the full revelation of the results of the revolution. I mean, mm-hmm. I said this before you, you, mm-hmm. you've been to Cornell. I, I went mm-hmm. to, I went to, you know, I went to college. Um, mm-hmm. I was talking about, my net worth with somebody this weekend. And he was kind of surprised that like his net worth was as high as it was. He's like, I don't really think I should say this out loud, but I'm going to tell you about it. Cause I really want to whisper it. Cause like where I came from, I didn't imagine that any of this was going to happen, but he did all the right things. Right. Mm-hmm. Like he, he, he said, you know, stayed married, <laughs> built up assets, um, you know, had his kids, got his kids out of the house. Da, 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 da. He did all the things that you're supposed to do. And what's weird to me is now in our era, we tie that to systemic racism or whiteness, and none of those things are color coded. Mm-hmm. They're just the elements of success. They're not color coded. Yeah. Being on time to a meeting when you're expected to be on time to a meeting is not color coded. Being on time is not acting white. Mm-hmm. It's just not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I I look at all this as, you know, my final victory over all those black people years ago, all of my, you know, f- fellow travelers who were trying to be whatever. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't Except part of that. On time. <laughs> <laughs> Except on time, behaving and getting the question right. Yes. Right. Anything but those three things. Right. Anything but those three things. Because, uh, oh. well, and even this, you even see this in the decline in rap culture. Right. Like Kanye was the first rapper mm-hmm. who kind of sort of pulled the 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 cover off of the game mm-hmm. and said, I'm not my mama had a job. I didn't sling drugs. I'm just the greatest rapper ever. Like, I'm just great. <laughs> my pain does not have to be a part of this struggle because there was no pain. I lived a middle-class life in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I'm doing this because I'm the greatest at it. Cause I have talent at it. That's why I'm doing it. That was mm-hmm. Kanye's fundamental before he went off the rails. Kanye's fundamental sort of mindset. Right. And that turned the world, that turned the world of rap culture inside out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Along mm-hmm. with Eminem, I think Eminem had a lot to do with that also, because who expected a white boy to be able to spit like that? But, you know. Yep. 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 And there's still the NBA and the NFL. Yeah, there's all those they're, things. They're my, they're my examples of why we don't, re- we, we don't really believe in affirmative action. When I'll we lay that out. We, you, 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 can't, you can't just you can't just you can't just drop that on the folks. You got to lay that out. Go ahead. Why, why don't we believe in affirmative when action? When we drive by a playground in the inner city, and we see a basketball court, mm-hmm. we have an idea in our mind about what the players are going to look like. They're going to look like me, and when they don't, well, those boys can really play ball. That's how we see it. That's it. There's that no other way of looking at it. 
And it's just showing people that all you need to do is just expand that mindset to every single industry, venture, and endeavor. And all of a sudden, it's cool. All right. of a sudden, it's cool. You know, the people who don't get it are people who, when they find out, I think I remember where I was, but when they find out, for example, the Eminem is not black, because I, I thought he was black. I listened to him and thought he was black. And then I had to be informed. No, this guy is white. What? It was a trip. Okay. Um, literally, it sounded like Urkel rapping, but could rap. That's what, and I remember being in a car listening to this, like, oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Um, uh, wait, what? He's what? Okay. Um, the people who then say, okay, this is either not legitimate or even worse. Cause that, that I can understand aesthetically or otherwise somebody taking that position. I think they're wrong, but I can understand that. I can't understand. I liked this until the moment I learned the identity of the person who is producing all of this rhetoric and music and beats, et cetera. And now because I know who he is, I no longer like this, that. And it's just yeah. like, you know, those people, they're, they're, they're not going to get it. No. But the rest of us, which is certainly most... Um, People in America who have lots of melanin. Okay, when when we when we go to an, an inner city basketball court, when we go to an NBA game or a college game, okay, where the college has enough students, okay, at least twenty thousand, uh, there's certain things we're expecting to see on a basketball court. Mm -hmm. And when we don't see them, we expect the people we do see there to be really good. Okay, fine. Um, well, that's the, why that's why Larry. Well, that's why Larry Bird. That. Well, that's why Larry Bird is the greatest white man to ever play basketball in the history of the NFL. Or, I'm sorry, the NBA. He just is. He just was. Like, he was just he better. Was he, he was good. He embarrassed everybody. You know the, you know the, uh, the, 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 you know the story of the, um, of the, when he come, when he, uh, uh the, uh, I think it was in the 1984, I think. I don't remember. Um, but Michael Jordan tells this story, um, because it was when he was either a rookie or in his second or third year in the NBA. Um, at the all-star game, they have the three-point shooting contest. And uh, Larry Bird walks in in his zip-up, walks onto the court in his zip-up, walks past the Lakers players, walks past the Celtics players, walks past everybody. And then you're talking about Robert Parrish, Magic Johnson. You talk about all those old boys, right? Jordan was just in the league. And he looks at the entire row of talent. He goes, who here wants to come in second? Goes <laughs> out, wins a three point. Wins a, does it even take his zip up off? Yep. Done. Yep. Comes in first, yep. takes takes his award, holds it up above his head, and then keeps the zip up on. Just walks right back out again. <laughs> That's brutal. That's Larry Bird. <laughs> yep. wow. Who here wants to come in second? Mm -hmm. Yep. Because you don't, and at that time in the NBA, you did not expect a white guy to be that good. You just didn't. Okay. Now, it opened up the door for Dan Martley and Christian Leitner and Bill Lambeer and all these other guys that wound up being really, really talented and really, really good because they worked on their craft. Yeah. Um, I would love it. And I, and I think the franchise is expanding anyway. Um, you know, the franchise is expanding. That's why I said, well, yeah, we have sports, but the franchise is expanding away from that. I mean, black people are moving into more and more areas and it's just eventually, like I said, at a certain point, we're just going to be Americans. That's coming much to probably Malcolm X's surprise. Well, I don't know. Cause some of his last comments, he's got one on interracial marriage and he basically yep. um, does some, delicate dancing to avoid having to say yeah i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> but you know gets to the point where he admits you know um that you know people are people and so he didn't have an issue with a man marrying a woman or a woman marrying a man regardless of what their colors were you know the colors of people which to thankfully to you know very many of your listeners may be as basic as what they're going to eat for dinner that's right. great. But it just it, not only was it not like that, you know, 60 years ago, uh, I mean, the Supreme Court decision that um, struck down um, 
racial intermarriage prohibitions on a state level throughout the United States. That decision isn't even 60 years old yet. You know, Loving v. Virginia is not 60 years old yet. So um, it used to not only be significant for very many people, it used to be the law in very many places. Um, anyway, um, yeah, but it, it's interesting because it, it take it brings me, I believe the comments were made the month before he was killed. Um, but it, it brings us to a moment where we can tie together, you know, his vision that, you know, grew over time. And frankly, I think a commitment to certain notions of freedom and justice that he had those. And thus, as he became more informed on um, how well, as he became more informed on human nature, he was able to get past that you know, what do I want to say? Do I want to say protean? Um, but basically um, the the white black racial dynamic that mm. fueled so much of, of his thought and rhetoric. Okay, he was finally able to get past that and see, okay, look, um, th there's more to life here. There's more to humanity here. There's more to America than just this dynamic. Um, and it's ironic because at that point, when he began to affirm that um, what equality means is, you know, you have these other people too, and they have their identities too, and they have the same rights as well, all of a sudden he, he actually became dangerous because now you have his background, his rhetoric, his platform, okay? You have his, his to his credit, his commitment to Islam um, went through the Nation of Islam version with their prophet Elijah Muhammad, right, to mm -hmm. Orthodox Islam with, you know, Muhammad Muhammad, right, that prophet um, from six, uh, 1400 years ago. Um, but the beliefs held, you know, when he continued to practice, continued to pray, his, you know, one wife and, a, you know, I believe they have five children. Um, and so he continued to show that moral example, continued to show that commitment to the belief system that he self-identified with for so long. OK. And now that he saw, hey, it's all of us in this boat and all of us have these rights, not black and white people are in this boat and we have the same rights they do. It's a very different posture, you understand. But once he got to that point, now he was actually dangerous because now he can no longer be a mouthpiece for somebody's um for somebody else's political agenda okay the political and the power agenda of the people who wanted to to make little kingdoms out of just black people whom they could then run and control okay arguably not very different from a plantation at all in very many respects just the color of the master anyway at that point he became um actually dangerous and then he was killed it's just so you know it does does it I would be shocked if, if, you know, evidence were produced, certainly because it's, you know, almost 60 years ago, 59 years ago, actually this month, 59 years ago, um, actually last week, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. 59 yep. years ago. Last week. Um, yep. Wow. That's terrible. February, February 21st. RIP to al Haj Malik Al-Shabazz. Um, well, yeah, let's... It, uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we're, we're, so I want to, well, I, I want, because this ties into, um, what we were going to we were going to talk about in the question that we we sort of been sort of been answering through the entire uh, through this entire episode today, um, and I want to talk I want to go into this a little bit deeper, um, but let's go back to the book. Let's pick up um, from Malcolm X's speech um, with Mrs. Fannie Lou Hammer. So um, uh, he gave this speech um, at um, uh, let's see. In December 1964, right, um, during the time when representatives of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party toured northern cities, seeking moral, political, and financial support for their campaign to block the seating of Mississippi's five segregationist U.S. representatives when Congress convened on, convened on January 4th, 1965. So he, he gave this speech in response to um, the... <clears throat> the um the the violence that um mrs fannie lou hammer um the mfdp candidate for congress um had um had experienced and her testimony that she gave before congress about racist brutality 
um, that had attracted wide attention at the Democrat Party National Convention in August of 1964. So he's giving this speech um, in response um, to uh, the events that occurred to Mrs. Fannie Lou Hammer. And I quote <laughs> Malcolm X, Reverend Joseph Coles Jr., Ms. Hammer, honored guests, brothers and sisters, and as Dorello pointed out, friends and enemies, <laughs> also ABC and CBS and FBI and CIA. <laughs> I couldn't help but be impressed at the outstart when the freedom singers were singing the song Oginga Odinga, because Oginga Odinga is one of the foremost freedom fighters on the African continent. At the time he visited Atlanta, Georgia, I think he was still the Minister of Home Affairs in Kenya. But since Kenya became a republic last week and Jomo Kenyatta ceased being the prime minister and became the president, the same person you are singing about, Oginga Odinga, is now Kenyatta's vice president. He's the number two man in the Kenyan government. The fact that you might be singing about him to me is quite significant. Two or three years ago, this wouldn't have been done. Two or three years ago, most of our people would choose to sing about someone who was, you know, passive and meek and humble and forgiving. Oginga Odinga is not passive. He's not meek. He's not humble. He's not nonviolent, but he's free. Oginga Odinga is vice president under Jomo Kenyatta, and Jomo Kenyatta was considered to be the organizer of the Mau Mau. I think you mentioned Mau Mau in that song. And if you analyze closely those words, I think you have the key to how to straighten out the situation in Mississippi. When the nations of Africa are truly independent, and they will be truly independent because they're going about it in the right way, the historians will give the prime minister, or rather President Kenyatta and the Mau Mau, their rightful role in African history. They'll go down as the greatest African patriots and freedom fighters that the continent ever knew, and they will give credit, be given credit for bringing about the independence of many of the existing independent states on that continent right now. There was a time when their image was negative, but today they're looked upon with respect. And their chief president, their chief is the president, and their next chief is the vice president. I have take I have to take time to mention that because, in my opinion, not only in Mississippi and Alabama, but right here in New York City, you and I could best learn how to get real freedom by studying how Kenyatta brought it to his people in Kenya and how Odinga helped him and the excellent job that was done by the Mau Mau freedom fighters. In fact, that's what we need in Mississippi. In Mississippi, we need a Mau Mau. In Alabama, we need a Mau Mau. In Georgia, we need a Mau Mau. Right here in Harlem in New York City, we need a Mau Mau. I say it with no anger. I say it with very careful forethought. The language you and I have been speaking to this man in the past hasn't reached him. And you can never really get your point across to a person unless you learn how to communicate with him. If he speaks French, you can't speak German. You have to know what language he speaks and then speak to him in that language. When I listen to Mrs. Hammer, a black woman, could be my mother, my sister, my daughter, describe what they had done to her in Mississippi, I ask myself, how in the world can we ever expect to be respected as men when we will allow something like that to be done to our women and we do nothing about it? And then a little bit la, la, la further down, when I was in Africa, I noticed some of the Africans got their freedom faster than others. Some areas of the African continent became independent faster than other areas. I noticed that in the areas where independence had been gotten, someone got angry. And in the areas where independence had not yet been achieved, no one was angry. They were sad. They'd sit around and talk about their plight, but they weren't mad. And usually when people are sad, they don't do anything. They just cry over their condition. Now, he goes on for a bit, and he talks about the Democrat Party. By the way, he calls them the Cracker Party. And then a little later on, once he breaks that down, um, he talks about the differences between the Republicans and the Democrats. And so a little bit later on, <clears throat> he says this, and I quote, they said, don't rock the boat. You might get Goldwater elected. I have this bit of suggestion. Find out what Wagner is going to do on behalf of his resolution that you're trying to get through before January 4th. Find out in advance where does he stand on these Mississippi con great congressmen who are illegally coming up from the South to represent Democrats. Find out where the mayor of the city stands and make him come out on the record without dilly-dallying and without compromise. Find out where his friends stand on CD the Mississippians who are coming forth illegally. Find out where Ray Jones, who is one of the most powerful black Democrats in this city, find out where he stands before January 4th. You can't talk about Rockefeller because he's a Republican, although he's in the same boat right along with the rest of them. I say so I say in my conclusion, as Mrs. Hammer pointed out, the brothers and sisters in Mississippi are being beaten and killed for no reason other than they want to be treated as first class citizens. There's only one way to be a first class citizen. There's only one way to be independent. There's only one way to be free. It's not something that someone gives to you. It's something that you take. Nobody can give you independence. Nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality or justice or anything. If you're a man, you take it. If you can't take it, you don't deserve it. Nobody can give it to you. 
So if you and I want freedom, if we want independence, if we want respect, if we want recognition, we obey the law, we are peaceful. But at the same time, at any moment that you and I are involved in any kind of action that is legal, that is in accord with our civil rights, in accord with the courts of this land, in accord with the Constitution, when all these things are on our side, we still can't get it? It's because we aren't on our own side. We don't yet realize the real price necessary to pay to see that all these things are enforced where we're concerned. And then later on, on the next page, and I'll close with this. They've always said that I'm anti-white. I'm for anybody who's for freedom. I'm for anybody who's for justice. I'm for anybody who's for equality. I'm not for anybody who tells me to sit around and wait for mine. I'm not any. I'm not for anybody who tells me to turn the other cheek when a cracker is busting up my jaw. I'm not for anybody who tells black people to be nonviolent when nobody is telling white people to be nonviolent. I know I'm in a church. I probably shouldn't be talking like this, but Jesus himself was ready to turn a synagogue inside out and upside down when things weren't going right. In fact, in the book of Revelations, they got Jesus sitting on a horse with a sword in his hand, getting ready to go into action. But they don't tell you and me about that Jesus. They only tell you and me about that peaceful Jesus. They never let you get down to the end of the book. They keep you up there where everything is, you know, nonviolent. Now go and read the whole book. And when you get to Revelations, you find that even Jesus' patience ran out. And when his patience ran out, he got the whole situation straightened out. He picked up the sword. That's that old time religion. That is brilliant. <laughs> I, brilliant. To, to paraphrase from the movie Patton by, with the great George C. Scott. When he was yelling about, uh, he went to uh, Corsica, or maybe it was Sicily. I can't remember right now. And he was looking at um, the results of the tank battle um, from the German, uh, the German uh, tank commander. I cannot remember his name, but he yells out, "I read your book." That's what I thought. <laughs> That's what I thought when I read this. Rommel, Rommel, I read- Rommel. I read your book. That's right. And well, uh, I don't know if Patton did. Montgomery actually did. <laughs> oh, I think Viscount oh, well, uh, Montgomery of Alamein actually did. Like he, he in his tent in North Africa had a picture of his enemy in the tent because he was that much in the zone. Uh, truly impressive. Uh, not that Patton wasn't; he was uh, flamboyant, very much an American, very uh, much, and and very effective. Um, and of very course, effective. also bearing the seeds of our culture's issues. And then you know that in part makes it tragic. It so, does. Yeah. So, you know, Malcolm X in leadership, right? Well, you know, <laughs> Malcolm X is... show up and open his mouth. And things change, you know? All right. So point I want to make. Um, and I think it's, it's one, it's one that struck me in reading, reading that speech um, about Mrs. with Mrs. Fanny Lou Hammer. Um, and we read the invisible man um, <laughs> and, and talked about nameless and you mentioned something in that episode, which I, which, which kind of triggered my brain. You said what that would be, a, it would be a different invisible man would be a different book. If, um, if nameless or the invisible man had opened up one of those letters, read what it saw and then gotten on the train, gone right back to Dr. Bledsoe with an ax <laughs> and just fixed the problem. Right. Yep. The, oh. Yep. <laughs> Malcolm X is the person that the Invisible Man transforms into once he's out of Ralph Ellison's basement. Um, yes, I, I see what you mean. Um, but he has to get out of that basement first. He does. Which is the hardest part. And I think that that's what Malcolm X saw. He saw that, or no, that saw. He confused nonviolent struggle with ralph ellison's invisible man and being trapped in that basement not struggling not just struggling not being right. violent right just not being violent just just hanging out keeping the lights on just hanging out right and and look i, I even wrote this in my notes you know nonviolent struggle has always been an anathema to non-christians um and and a foolishness to a person who believes that violence is the logical response right um you know we preach christ crucified <laughs> you know, a stumbling block to, uh, to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, I believe was how Paul put it. And yeah. so, um, right. On. Finish, uh, the right. Quote. Finish the quote. Uh, I don't know. The, but to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. <laughs> there you go. There so, go. um, but this is also why nonviolent struggle really only worked, worked. And I, I put that in air quotes, 
um, but worked in like twice in the 20th century. You know, you had Dr. R- the, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, mm-hmm. And then you had Gandhi. And that's really it. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. And man, you know, revolutions may be driven initially by the desire to correct injustice, but too often they are hijacked by people with other motives. And usually those mm-hmm. other motives are the seven deadly sins. Um, again, from that great actor, Morgan Freeman, that great black actor, Morgan Freeman, there are seven deadly sins, Dorolo. And, you know, The revolutionary is angry at the oppressor, yes, but they're also angry at their own Dr. Bledsoe's. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And and so... Yeah. And so now you have... Now we live in a world, we live in a, in a, in a Black Lives Matter world, we live in a DEI world in America anyway, which I think is the last gasp of, of nonsense. I, I don't nope. think That'll it's going... It will morph into something else. I would bet you money. I'm not a betting man. I would bet you money. There will be the new iteration. It will continue until Christ returns. And okay, yes. We need yes. those efforts to get everybody's attention, get everybody angry about what really isn't an issue. Or when it is an actual issue, great. Oh, okay. It's a particular issue. Deal with it. Deal with the issue. Okay. Um, the So at the protest I was at over the weekend, um, the woman I was speaking to, one of them, Um, We brought up North Charleston, okay? North Charleston refers to one of these incidents where a policeman shot and killed a black man, okay? Then lied about it, and everything was going one way until a kid shows up with a video that shows that this man lied. He said this man was running toward him. The video shows the man running the other way and being shot in the back and killed, okay? Policeman was fired. The policeman was arrested. The policeman was prosecuted. That's the system working. Right, the jury acquits the man. That shows brokenness in the system, okay? It's really straightforward in terms of the evidence, whatever, okay? Um, that's one thing. That's a particular circumstance and it needs to be dealt with, okay? And um, to then take it and extrapolate it over the whole country. Now, remember where this happened. South Carolina, local matters, regionalism matters, Okay. Yeah, that's where the competitory started in South Carolina. This mm-hmm. happened in South Carolina. Okay, mm-hmm. to then extrapolate that throughout the whole country um, to cover every single incident where somebody claims the police did something wrong. It's just, it's infuriating, right? Um, right. But it, it also obscures the issue. North Charleston, that's a tragedy. That's an issue. That needs to be addressed there, you know? And you can't do that by social media. You can't do that from a television studio in Los Angeles or whatever. You have to do that on the ground in North Charleston living there you talked about paying the price Mm -hmm. of the actual revolution that's some of Mm -hmm. the price some of the cost you know okay if i actually care about these people and these issues i gotta put roots in the ground i gotta put boots not just boots in the ground i put roots in the ground like a tree and and that takes the thing that's awesome about trees one of the things they take time to grow right there's no quick fix to what happened in, in in north charles there's no quick fix to that no. You know, I think it can be done in a generation, but with well, the right type of sacrifice, with the right type of investment, with institutions. One of the reasons I don't find Invisible to be like Malcolm X is, for better or for worse, um, his moment of revelation of change happened when he then got integrated into into an institution, and it's the institution of the Nation of Islam that gave him a platform on upon which he could stand, and then with all of his rhetorical brilliance, you know, communicate to people and then was leading. He needed an institution. He got one from the beginning. Invisible had no institution. The institution he was part of was morally bankrupt. Um, Both of them, the one in the South and the one in the North. (laughs) The one in the South that was an education institution and the one in the North that was a political one. Um, Each of them was morally bankrupt. Um, And, you know, it's more means justifying ends nonsense, right, that goes part and parcel, not just with Marxism, but with any oppressive system, okay, where you don't matter. Um, Your only utility comes from how you will help us achieve our goals. And when we're done with you, we don't care what happens to you. Turn okay, and burn, so you know? so what is what is the <clears throat> so 
solutions to problems, right? Mm-hmm. I am a am a obviously a partisan for Christianity. I believe uh-huh. that that is the thing that uh, changes people's hearts um, and changes people from from. It, it changes people. It changes institutions. It's the most revolutionary. Talk about revolutionary. It is the most revolutionary religion on the planet. Full stop. Period. Yep. Full stop. Yep. Uh, yep. Nothing else gets close. It just doesn't. It, and I'll uh-huh. take the Pepsi challenge on it, against anybody who's listening to me on that. Um, you can't find me a more revolutionary uh, religion than Christianity. You just mm-hmm. you, you just can't. Mm-hmm. Um, here in the West. And we talked a lot about this last year on the podcast, but here in the West, we we collectively decided we were going to walk out um, Frederick Nietzsche's quote about killing God, right? We decided collectively we were going to do that over the course of 100 years. Mm-hmm. And now we're at the end of all of that. I firmly believe we're at the end of postmodernism and we're casting around for something else and we're not finding it. And the thing that we, I believe fundamentally the thing we have to go back to is Christianity. Um. But at a very narrow level for black people in America, mm-hmm. um, we caught the car of racial justice. We caught the car of equal protection under the law. We caught the car of broad social acceptance um, and even interracial marriage, right? We've, mm-hmm. we've caught the cars that we were chasing like dogs down the street. We, we've caught them, right? Um, and... There's no prize for coming in second, and I'm worried that we have a bunch of people who are riding on the coattails of past revolutions and past racisms and past this and past that to cover up for their incompetency and their, quite frankly, their mediocrity. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my shorts episode that I released this week, one of the things I said uh, because I, I do lay out a vision for black people, a five-step vision for black people <laughs> moving forward wow. into the future. And, you know, it's all common stuff. But one of the p- parts of the vision is don't go get a job being a government bureaucrat. We don't need more government bureaucrats. We need more entrepreneurs. Mm. Mm. Don't don't go get a government job. Don't go get a corporate job. Go work for a small business. Mm. Go Go start something from the ground up. Do a side hustle. Something. Anything. We don't need more of you in the civil service. Politics will not protect us anymore. Hmm. Um, so here's how this ties into leadership. You mean the government won't protect us anymore? Is that what you mean? I don't think so, no. Either protect us in terms of giving us sinecures huh, that are with guaranteed salaries and pensions, hmm. or protect us in terms of even getting you know justice from a jury. I at, at long last, black people have become just Americans. <laughs> and you can see it most notably in our current era in how united everyone is about illegal immigration being a real problem. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I guess my question to close out is what a what do leaders, what should leaders take from Malcolm X? What, what can they take? What can they use? How can leaders solve this problem of what to do after you win the revolution, <laughs> but not in the way you expected to, right? Like, you got what you wanted, to paraphrase from Amy Mann, the great singer in that song in Magnolia. Uh, there's a great line in that song from the 1990. 1990- film our 1999 film our 98 Mm. baby um directed by paul thomas anderson uh where she sings you got what you wanted and now you can hardly stand it like (laughs) (laughs) yeah i'm dropping pop culture references all over the place in this sucker but what do leaders what can leaders learn from malcolm x let's start with that what can they apply to their real lived lives from the words and the statements and the speeches of this man Well, um, he obviously knew what leadership was, um, but one of the most powerful, I think one of the most powerful examples that we came across in his um, speeches in this book edited by George Brightman, Mm -hmm. um, 
ironically or not, is him talking about the mainstream civil rights movement. Um, mm-hmm. And what I'm just going to call this section is the Carlisle Group. Okay, and of course, I'm not mm-hmm. referring to the um, financial services entity or you know private private equity fund, whatever they are. Um, though they take their name from the same place. Okay, mm-hmm. the Carlisle, aka the Carlisle Hotel. Okay, even though it's formal, proper name was the Carlisle. Okay, he in about two pages describes apparently how somebody created a committee that they then financed, that they then used to recruit, popularize, and then suborn a march on Washington. Mm. So that, like a virus, this committee infected its own ideas into the host, and that all of a sudden, their version of the movement was what the movement was. And I thought it was a brilliant example of how leadership actually works. I thought it was a brilliant example. Okay. Um, How um, a committee of people can lead better than one person in this type of sense. Okay. Um, Because it's not about decision making only. Um, There are other aspects to leadership. And this committee, apparently, just they did an excellent job. Um, Whether you agree with what they did or not, well, actually, so my assumption is what he's talking about is relatively accurate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And so whether you agree with what they did or not, to me, it was a brilliant example of leadership. Okay. Um, And I thought that I thought that was worth something. Okay. Um, As an example of how this worked uh, and how leadership works. Okay. Then um, there's also the lesson that the leader's personal life actually matters. Okay. One of the reasons that um, one of the reasons that um, Malcolm X had a moral resonance is because morally speaking, once he became Muslim, his life was pretty clean. Okay. One wife, here are the kids a respectable family man who then gets up there and then launches into his rhetoric, right? Um, Just pounding people over the head with his rhetoric um, around the notion that the Tyrian oppression that was, that had been plaguing black people, as he said, for 310 years um, needed to end and needed to end now. And that we would end it, whether it was by voting or by shooting, we will end it. And so it, it had he had a force in his life and the things going on in his personal life helped explain why he had such force okay um and then what's his mo for leadership well apparently it was speech making i don't see that he did anything else i don't see that he did anything than show up and talk literally it's brilliant and not even show up and lecture and you have to get through content in a curriculum not even that Show up and deliver your insights on topic X. Bang, next, bang, next. Bang. It's, it's brilliant, okay? Um, and so, uh, but it's not merely brilliant. It's also leadership, right? Mm-hmm. Because he gave a voice to what many people were feeling, certainly. And what they obviously couldn't put into words as, as brilliantly as he did. Um, and it caused things to change and so those are you know among the measurements for me that show that it's leadership okay he's giving a voice to people who had these feelings didn't know how to put them in the words but then it's provoking action okay he shows up and he talks and things start changing i wonder how and we'll never know obviously but i wonder what martin luther king jr thought of him when they both sat down without cameras around and the other followers and all like, I wonder what that, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that conversation because, yeah. <clears throat> and it had to happen at least twice because mm-hmm. what we now know is the FBI and the C, not the CIA, <laughs> he, he, he claimed CIA. Um, and maybe they were watching him when he went overseas. They probably were, but the FBI actively was, what well, was had a file open on Malcolm X and found nothing by the way nothing there's never been anything that's ever been revealed to to, to your point about anything i mean hoover was looking for it hoover hoover knew what to look for by that point i mean he would run the fbi for like 20 30 freaking years he knew what to look for nothing on martin luther king jr though Mm -hmm. (laughs) we know there are things the fbi found on him that Mm -hmm. that that if they had been revealed at the time 
yep. would have discredited um, Martin Luther King Jr. from doing the work that he did. Okay, we know this for a fact. Yep. I wonder if that asceticism came through in Malcolm X's interpersonal interactions with um, with Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Or, or if it was just, you know, two gals on a stroll on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. You know, we're just two gals having a chat. <laughs> yep. Like how much of that personality that was in the oratory carried into now we're just going to have to sit here and talk one-on-one and, and figure something out. I always wonder about that with guys like that because you're right. The personality was so strong and seemingly unscripted, which means it was natural talent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would say things like, as an orator will do, he will say things, watch the crowd and then give them more of that. Hitler did the same thing. He, that's yeah. why he was a great, he was, he was a great orator. I mean, look, he can't, there's a lot of everything else, please. But like, he knew how to move the crowd. Yep. You know, you cannot take that away from him. And he knew how to move the crowd in a way that Roosevelt didn't and Mussolini didn't. Those guys did. Churchill probably got close, close second. On that, Churchill knew how to move the crowd, but that's mm-hmm. because Churchill worked on it <laughs> for so long, right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Malcolm X, man, he he seems to have just shot from the hip. He seems to have literally just showed up. You point him at a microphone, and that man just goes. Mm-hmm. Yep, but he I, kept I he kept learning. Um, right. He kept learning. Um. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I think that led him, you know, on a path that was certainly more truthful, but mm-hmm. was wending toward the truth, which is, you know, which was exciting. How much, do you th- short, so. how, how much do you think, do you think that there could have been a rapprochement between him and Dr. King? He, without Malcolm X becoming a Christian, I doubt it. Um, okay. so I found some of his comments. Um, so the, the comment you quoted where he's talking about Al Quran, um, I found some of it. Um, what the heck is this? Sorry, some of it, um, inaccurate. And so, um, let me find it. Um, there it is. It's on page 12. It's still in message to the grassroots. There's nothing, quote, there's nothing in our book, Al Quran. That teaches us to suffer peacefully. To suffer peacefully yeah. I believe that's true. It's the next bits. <laughs> Quote, our religion teaches us to be intelligent, period. Be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. Uh, semicolon, close quote. I don't believe that it teaches respect for the law that is produced in Dalur al Harp. Right. In in the realm of war, which is one of the ways in in, in Orthodox Islam, the world is divided into two pieces, right? Correct. Darul Islam, the realm of peace or submission, and then Darul Sharp, the the realm of war. Okay. And so I don't believe it teaches in the realm of war when whoever is sovereign lays down the law and the person is a pagan or an unbeliever that you need to obey. Uh, I don't believe that's what it says. And so, um, I think there's a particular dilemma that Muslims walk who live within the West and thus who live within uh, political and social structures that have a Christian base um, is that, you know, how, how do you navigate that line? And, you know, as as I believe is the case with for virtually everyone, you have to ask them to find out. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just from the outside. I see I see a tension there. Okay, and it's a tension that resonates when you hear some of the rhetoric coming from other parts of the world where the things that the Islamists, as as they're popularly called now, um, when you you hear and read what they're saying, that tension all of a sudden is resonating. It's like it's Mm -hmm. glowing and it's like, yes, there's a tension, you know, and so there's different positions that, you know, Muslims within the West take on it. But anyway, um, this is interesting because that's like I, I remember reading those comments and saying, "Oh, okay, agree with the first one." And it's like, nope, th- not this one. Mm. Let's circle this right here. Somewhere well, I mean, in there are the notions that give rise to the necessary politicization of Islam. It's right. part of the DNA of the religion. 
Right. And so, you know, that's that's why there are states all over the world that happen to be Muslim states. And it's it's not an accident. It's not an accident that happened from Morocco to Indonesia. You know, it's not an accident. It's in the right. DNA of the of the religion, whereas the DNA of Christianity, as it were, uh, is not political. Um, it no. is in the Bible, uh, you know, to submit to the governing authorities is there, mm-hmm. you know, what uh, X, what, what, or what, let's not call him his second name, call him his third name, what um, Mr. Al-Shabazz said, right? Um, and what he, what he was advocating for, I would argue, was merely, you know, um, calling into question the hypocrisies and the systemic oppressions of a system where it's like, you say you're Christian, well, do what Jesus said, <laughs> you know, um, and that would have put it, frankly, that would have put it better. Okay, right. you're a Christian to do what Jesus said. If you do that, we're good. If you won't do that, do not turn to me and tell me that I need to. Okay, um, because apparently you're willing to accept that we're going to depart from this because this is how you're really behaving. And then would be the devolution back to that old time religion, right? Mm-hmm. An eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, you know, which is reprisal and vendetta, you know, which is right. what happened with uh, with Pashtun Wali. Okay, which is probably my favorite way it's ever articulated. It's an institution among the Pashtun people um, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it's just it's really fascinating. But it's basically, you know, um, me against you, you and I against our cousin, you and I and our cousin against our uncle, you and I are a cousin and uncle against the next house, against the next street, against the, you know. But what what is at bottom, right, is a mechanism Mm -hmm to produce some kind of justice when there's an injury that's done to someone in that network. And so, yeah, old time religion. Well, and what's interesting is as we've wandered away from old time religion, and again, I've, I've, I've said this before on this episode, but I'll say it again. I think that leaders need a baseline of meaning that comes from something deeper than whatever their current role may be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that baseline of meaning will keep you either as close to pure huh, right that yeah as close to pure as you could probably get this side of the grave um mm. and that is a and, th- and that's a lot of weight to put on a system of meaning and i don't think a non-religious system of meaning is going to be able to carry that weight i just i don't mm. i don't i don't i don't the track record is not good let's just say that mm-hmm. the, tra- the track record mm-hmm. is not in the positive all right well I think we've covered everything. I think we've uh, we've gotten to the end of uh, of our time here together today. So I'd like to thank DeRolo Nixon Jr. Esquire for coming on and joining us once again uh, on our podcast. He will be back in July talking about the American founding documents, the USS Constitution, the Federalist Papers, the USS. <laughs> it's not a ship. Yes, the ship, the ship of state. Yeah. (laughs) And of course, since it's an election year, who knows what will be happening? We will talk about the ship of state and where it may happen to be in July. Uh, Hopefully, ship of state will still be floating. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But Dorola will be joining us in July. So pick up those episodes, listen to those episodes, listen to the Invisible Man episode, um, listen to the episode where we talk about um, the the global Appalachia. <laughs> uh, we talked about that last year in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence episodes. Um, and uh, of course, go out and pick up or go ahead and read online the speeches, statements, and utterings of Malcolm X and see how you could apply those to your real lived leadership life. Once again, my name is Hassan Sorrells. This is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast. And we're out. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast today. And now that you've made it this far, you should subscribe to the audio version of this show on all the major podcast players, including Apple iTunes, Spotify, YouTube Music, and everywhere else where podcasts are available. There's also a video version of our podcast on our YouTube channel. 
Like and subscribe to the video version of this podcast on the Leadership Toolbox channel on YouTube. Just search for Leadership Toolbox and hit the subscribe button there on YouTube. And uh, while you're doing that, leave a five-star review if you like what we're doing here on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Just go below the player and hit five stars. We need those reviews to grow, and it's the easiest way to help grow this show. And tell all your friends, of course, in leadership. By the way, if you don't like what we're doing here, well, you can always listen to another leadership show. There are several other good ones out there. At least that's what I've heard. All right. Well, uh, that's it for me. <laughs>